This is Bryce Van Patten with Metal Express Radio Backstage, and today my guest is one of the founding members of one of the quintessential bands that formed the new wave of British heavy metal movement, the band uh, Saxon, and my guest, guitarist Paul Quinn. How's it going today, Paul? Excellent, thank you. Nice to speak to you, Bryce. First time I saw you guys was in 1985 in Salem, Oregon, when you were touring with Accept. Yeah. Long time ago? Yeah, but it's, it's still in my memory banks. Uh, I think uh, it might have been Salem or Portland itself where we took a 10 or 20 fans a ride around the city in our bus. <laughs> I have to say, you were in Salem, you guys were louder than God. <laughs> <laughs> and he's <was> pretty loud. <laughs> Saxon turns 45. Did you ever imagine back in 1977? that the band would not be just together, but still thriving in the year 2022? Well, the word for that is no. <laughs> but there were sh short, um, short careers, it seemed, when we were starting. Even in the 70s, the, they weren't bands that you would expect to last beyond the end of the 80s. But how did we do it? I don't really know, apart from tenacity and uh, bloody-mindedness. Mm -hmm. And a bit of ability, too. How is it playing in a band when your newest member has been there going on 27 years? <laughs> well, it's no good complaining about your aches and pains because they're getting them as well. <laughs> right. But uh, adrenaline takes all the pain away, which is why musicians continue to do it. You know, the, uh, the feeling of making an audience feel great makes us feel great. We can't forget the crowd. They're, they're, you know, they're where we write the songs. Now, a lot of bands that have been together as long as you guys um, tend to try and reinvent themselves. Can you talk about why Saxon is not one of those bands? Ooh. You know what I mean? I do, yeah. Um, well, the, the, the ultimate example is David Bowie. I've no idea why some of them do it, but uh, in our case, we had a slight flirtation with AOR, but it didn't work, so we went back to what we do better. There's not much I can answer on this one, I'm afraid. Uh, no problem. I feel it's just like, you know, your guys' sound is is almost like a brand. And mm. obviously, with, um, you know, Biff on vocals, you guys have your own sound. And I and I think um, it's really great that you, you don't try to change it all up for all the people, you know, that, of course, that have been with you guys all this time and, and all the new fans as well. Yeah, yeah. Um... Like you said, his instantly recognizable voice and the fact that he, he's the editor of whatever riffs we play in, uh -huh. means that as long as he's in the band, it will always sound like this. Mm -hmm. Can you because, tell me, um, other than like, you know, uh, Biff's voice, what makes a Saxon song a Saxon song? Some pushing and pulling in, in, the, uh, in the arrangements happens mm -hmm. when we play. You know, we don't um, we don't tend to pretty up stuff. If someone feels like there's an offbeat to p to play, he'll play it. And if nobody joins him, then you know, hard luck. <laughs> That's always been the case with this band. We we, we get tidied up slightly, but uh, that Andy's job rather than ours. I must mention Andy Sneak because he's he's like the fifth Saxon. Really, he's understands the eighties. Yeah, that's actually was I've about three questions down I have here. How was it working with Andy Sneap, and um, how did you guys come together with him? I know that you um, toured with Priest several years back on Thunderbolt, if that's correct. Yeah, it, yeah, it predates that even. Uh, a festival in Austria that he uh, he must have been there with Hell, although I don't remember watching Hell, but um, he came over and said, you, you guys need a good producer, and I said, yeah. <laughs> All right. We've had a few good producers, but Andy's the, the ultimate, really, because he, he, know, he knows a performance rather than a perfect take. And his ears are still good enough to play with Priest, which is, you know, astounding, really, that anybody's ears can recover so quickly, because mine don't. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. <laughs> Can you catch me up a little bit and catch us up a little bit on what it's been like for the last two years with the pandemic and how it's affected the music industry and, and you guys? Uh, boring and depressing. 
mostly. <laughs> <laughs> but we managed to meet up whenever there was a, you know, a, a, a relief from lockdown. So it, if it wasn't playing, it was at least discussing arrangements and what riffs we were going to use. Do you just like put together when you guys aren't together rehearsing? Do you just kind of put together riffs and then trade them around, or how, how does that work? Um, we had a a basic outline of of uh, wanting to make it more riffy anyway. So we, in, in the case of this album, there's a lot that uh, Nibs wrote before anybody had even put uh, a pick to guitar instead uh-huh. of pen to paper, and. Um, Yes, we use most mostly his stuff, but um, put our uh, st- indelible stamp on it, and some things got changed to suit the vocals, which always happens anyway, because you know Biff's the uh, editor, as I said, and uh, sometimes he swaps lyrics around to a different song if he thinks it suits better. Now, during the pandemic, you guys released an album of cover songs called Inspirations. Correct. Yeah. Can you talk about how that came together? Like, did everybody pick songs or how did that work? There was a lot of crossover, actually, in uh, in that, um, you know, if I chose three, somebody else would choose one of them. So it it it, uh, it became quite difficult to remember which one which ones were whose. But um, it was a blast to make something that we hadn't written. You know, we didn't have to think too hard apart from come up with our own solos. You put your own spin on some of your favorite songs. Yeah, exactly. And being done in in a, in a mansion was a blast as well. Oh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the, the, we we knew that um, Zeppelin had used a, a, a stairwell for drums, and we copied that idea. And it did sound very big. You know, it doesn't all fit in the grooves, but it it, it could have been. Uh, it could have been an echoey mess, but you have to use the closer mics. And uh, the cellar was quite boomy, which that's where we put the guitar cabinets for separation, that's the word. So I don't know if the bass was DI'd or reamped later, I can't remember now, because I didn't stay in the control room with Jackie while he was doing the, uh, the engineering. He produces as well. He's our live sound guy, Jackie uh-huh. Lehman. Well, the new album, Carpe Diem, it feels like modern Saxon of the last 10 years, but it also feels a lot like classic Saxon from like your first five or six albums. Can you tell me how it was working on, on the record? Well, we didn't see each other a great deal. Uh, Nibs did his parts in, in his, his home in Germany. Doug did his in his home. Um, Jackie recorded... Nigel in Germany because Jackie lives in Germany. Yeah, I understand to, getting uh, in and out of Germany was pretty difficult during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I did a bit of that because my daughter lives there. But um, there's a lot of testing here and, and showing people, or or in case you know, at least printing documents if not showing them because you know most immigration people are too busy to even look at them. You just, just get you... waved, waved through with a, with a, you know, sometimes you don't even get the temperature on your forehead. No, they just sit, wave the document and keep moving. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you've got one. That's very good of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I went to Andy's or Biff's because I'm, I'm digitally backward, let's call it, for want of a better word. Uh huh. I've, I've learned how to put my own tracks down, but not a lot else. So I wanted to tell you, one of my favorite songs on the new record is Remember the Fallen. And uh-huh. uh, and how did that song uh, come together? I know that I understand that you guys had a lot of the material before the pandemic, but that song definitely talks about the pandemic. Yeah, it um, it, it seems depressing to, to even talk about doing a song about it. But, but you know, it's it's part of history now, so it should be remembered in song. As we like history so much. Definitely. I, the band has always had a, a flair for having some historical themes. Another song on the album, Pilgrimage, is that one of the tunes? Am I right? 
Guys? It to me uh, reminded me a little bit of Broken Heroes in just not in the, the song writing, but just kind of in the, the sound and everything, which oh, has always been one of my favorite Saxon songs um, from mm. the 80s. It feels to me as, the, as though... Uh, as though the verse might be mine, but I can't actually remember. It's funny when when you put out a new album, it's it's brand new to all the listeners. But by the time the band, uh, you've probably heard the recordings, you know, hundreds of times. Yeah, yeah, they 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 became uh, formularized by Nibs because uh, he's the best engineer amongst us. Uh-huh. Although, although Biff's a close second, but. Uh, you know he can he can work some magic and play the guitar parts as well, so we could have released it with just him playing. But you know we thought it didn't sound a lot like Saxon with him playing alone. That, that's partially a joke, Bryce. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say also, um, you have a really excellent guitar tone. Can you <laughs> talk a little bit about your guitar rig? You know, people used to say about uh, a pianist that he has a lovely touch. Well, I think you can say that about guitar players. If, although in the case of metal, you could say they've got an ugly touch. But um, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> thank you. I tend to, uh, you know, starting with the guitar end, I tend to use mostly the the bridge pickup for definitely for rhythms and kind of slice the strings at thirty degrees. In other words, you're getting lo- more power by not having the pick parallel to the strings without overhitting and making the strings go sharp. So after that, in the studio, it would be any old cable. Live, it would be a transmitter to an American wireless. Right. Then it would go into uh, first to Wawa and uh, I can't remember the name of the boost. There's, yeah, there's another yeah. boost. Yeah, do you use um, kind of like classic guitar pedals, or do you use like a modern processor, or kind of what's what's your what's your thing like in your guitar rig? What do you like to use? I'm not too fussy to be honest. I, I've recently uh, got one of these fly rigs, you know, the Paul Lander One. That this is just for playing at home mostly, but um, in a live situation, I'd I'd use at the back. Um, Marshall JVM amps with 412s in, in the studio I'd use that plus a PV uh, 5150 yeah those are great sounding oh yeah well the, the uh, they complement each other because the 5150 is a bit scooped and the Marshall is the opposite so it makes a pretty sweet sound combined yeah but in a live situation, for ease of setup and uh, you know something that you don't really mess with is there's between the pedals and the uh, Marshall, there's a Kemper running four or five sounds for cleans and solos and things. So I was going to ask, I uh, uh, to change the subject a little bit. I understand that Biff had a, had some health trouble here in the last couple years yeah he had a a a heart attack and uh, had to go to get a bypass which is a big operation you know they open your chest bones up it's not keyhole surgery by any stretch that's where they that's where they actually cut your pull your ribs open Mm -hmm. yeah um so we were a bit scared there for him and uh he seems to have come through it Stronger than ever. Yeah, he sounds great. Seems it's I mean, not the first either. <laughs> you know, um, well, I don't mean for the operation. I mean uh, in the band, it, Nigel had a a brain hemorrhage, so he's he's got some kind of stent up there. Wow. Well, we all tend to break down a little bit as we get old. So yeah, you don't even have to get old. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. Some of us don't. Some of us break down a little bit without getting old at all. But um, when you guys were getting together, I was just getting out of high school. So um, perfect, perfect time to school. perfect time to get to here is then. Exactly, exactly. I remember 1980. A friend of mine and I we we walked up to a record store, which I don't know that they have many of those anymore. But 1980 being such a great year for metal. And 
he picked up wheels of steel and I had grabbed heaven and hell. And it's like, man, we went back and just played the hell out of those records. And uh, <laughs> 1980, I believe you guys put out two records. Was it wheels yeah. of steel and um, it's strong arm. Yeah. Strong arm of the law. Great, great stuff. And, That's uh, because managers used to think that we'd have short careers and you know, they were wrong. <laughs> so he had to put out an album every six months. It took his years to realize that we're the bosses, not the managers. You know, that the managers are only bosses if they're allowed to be. They probably like to be, right? Yeah, well, they get paid well enough. <laughs> the, the soccer guys, they, they, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're only allowed to manage if, if the uh, club says they can manage. That's a good rule. <laughs> yeah. I like that. So... What are the band's plans for 2022? There's a festival season coming up, but I've not seen the dates yet. Um, there's a November tour of the UK. Is Vakken on this year? It's not been cancelled yet. Are you guys scheduled? No, we're not. No. Biff might be. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that we, we can find a couple of days to give him if they want us. So... Is Saxon having any plans to come to the United States when they do the tour? We're working on one, yeah. Or the management is. You know, we finally found a, found good management who don't treat us like a commodity. Well, that's great. I mean, you guys deserve the respect. You know, you've been doing this a long time. Just, just I wanted to say, you know, just really love the new record. I think it's going to do great for you guys. I'm, I'm so glad that you know, heavy metal bands still make CDs and vinyl mm. in this di in this digital age when when people barely buy anything anymore. They just have a playlist through a streaming service. You know, the shock is that, uh, that I think ours is coming out on cassette. Oh, are you are you guys doing the cassette as well? I think I've seen it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Do you listen to cassettes? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are people with antique cars, you know, that want, want vintage cars. Right, right. Because I have a cassette deck down in my basement, but I can't say that I've used it, and I and I don't foresee wanting to, to ever use it again. <laughs> because I understand that it's it's kind of a cool vintage vibe, but I always thought cassettes sounded so bad, you know. You go in the studio and you make a fantastic record, and then you listen to it on a cassette, and you're like, what happened? Right, if if the wall and flutter is bad, definitely. Excellent. I was going to ask you, I couldn't quite make out what kind of guitar you were playing. Okay, it's a uh, Japanese built, but it's a Welsh guy who lives in Los Angeles who, who runs a company for the Luthier. And they're called uh -huh. Cap Caparison. Uh -huh. They're a kind of Gibson meets Fender hybrid. Right, so is that like a set neck then? Um, no, actually, no, the, the, the next bolt on, uh, like I say, the tone, the tone seems really incredible from yours and for, uh, Doug. Yeah, I, I do, uh, sometimes <clears throat> if the guitar needs it, I'll put a bare knuckle in the, in the bridge. Well, that's all I have for you today, Paul. I want to thank oh, you so much for, uh, for joining us. The new album Carpe Diem is out, and I hear you guys are already getting great reviews on it, including mine. I gave you guys a nice 9 out of 10. Love the record. That's high, and, thanks. Uh, and I think it, it belongs in every Metalhead's collection. You guys keep up the awesome work, and thanks again for joining me. Pleasure. All right, Paul, thanks. Have a great day. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in a good one so far. Thanks.